It's time for the, the Douglas, Douglas Coleman, Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From, from the, the entertainment, entertainment industry, industry to, to authors, authors to political, to political and, and social commentators, commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas, Douglas Coleman. Coleman. Well, hello there. Heidi, heady ho there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? We've got James Morrow here today. James is an author, science fiction, fantasy type author. Uh, he's got a book out. It's a trilogy book uh, written by three different people. And it's called, And the Last Trump Shall Sound, A Future History of America. He will tell us about that. I believe Kat Rambo, who is one of the other authors, will be on the show later in the month. I seem to remember that name on our schedule, but I'll have to look at it again. But it's not a name one easily would forget. So I I think that's, uh, we can expect to have Kat Rambo on the show sometime in the near future. So James and I get into an interesting discussion about AI taking over the world and uh, all kinds of stuff. For more information on James and his books, you can go to jamesmorrow.net and find all the information there that you will need. So don't go away. We will be right back with James Morrow. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John, uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through the Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at ProTruthPledge.org. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? 
Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, James Morrow. Hi, James. How are you? I'm doing great, Douglas. Good to be here. Yep. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, you are an author, and what else? <laughs> is that what you do? Are you an author? Actually, uh, grinding out fiction is my day job. I've been very fortunate in uh, being able to do it throughout most of my career full time uh, with uh, hiatuses for uh, freelance nonfiction work that fell into my lap. Uh, and uh, that was a reliable paycheck as opposed to royalty statements. Well, that's um, true. But uh, I cannot complain. I've never had a bestseller, but I've managed to, to tread water, kite a few credit cards, and remain in the game. I'm looking at your bio. It says you were born 1947. So you've been at this for a while. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, an, it's been a lifelong obsession. I'm trying to think my math my math skills in my head. Um, Forty. Oh, you're asking me how old I am. Well, no, I'm tr my wife. She I'm trying to figure out how, how much I'm, older. I'm seventy three. My wife says. Okay. Seventy three. Okay, because it's easier to figure that way. I'm just trying to figure out how much older you are than I am, because oh, okay. I was born in 1962, so that that's uh -huh. 15 years. We're 15 years apart. Okay. All right. Now, the only reason I like to know that is because if I reference something in pop culture, we're more or less in the same area. I'll probably get it. Yeah, yeah you'll probably get it. Where if I'm talking to somebody who's 19, they're not mm -hmm. going to know half of the people that I reference. So, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, okay, so you want to just tell us a little about your background and... Uh, then we'll talk about your book that uh, in the last Trump shall sound. So tell us a yeah, little well, about yourself first, and then we'll talk about the book. Yeah. Well, I grew up in the Philadelphia suburban town of Roslyn. Uh, technically, I began producing fiction when I was seven years old. I dictated a, uh, a, uh, an effort called The Story of the Dog Family to my mother, who dutifully typed it up on a battered typewriter that she had acquired uh, at a rummage sale. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, but we did have that typewriter. And uh, I thought of the story of the dog family as a novel. It was divided into chapters, I think six chapters. Now, to be sure, each of those chapters was about four sentences long. So technically, it was not a novel. but. Um, but that's how I thought of it, and I, at an early age, fell in love with storytelling, with narrative. Uh, I didn't uh, work within the medium of prose fiction so much as I did my own comic books and some amateur theater in junior high school and high school. My friends and I made our own eight millimeter horror movies and science fiction films and then we got a little more literary and we did an adaptation of the rhyme of the ancient mariner um I, so it's, i would say that the the tributaries feeding the river of my imagination are popular culture low culture if you will uh the the horror movies that my friends and i devoured and and mimicked uh to the keyed to famous monsters of Filmland magazine that we all had subscriptions to. But the other major tributary was uh, this sort of inroad, in, in, inverse road to Damascus experience I had in 10th grade, where I was introduced to the universe of world literature uh, in, amazing, in an amazing course at Abington Senior High School. Uh, in the Philadelphia suburbs. We read Kafka, Camus, Dostoevsky, Flaubert, um, in particular, the voices that spoke to me were 
the, 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 the artist whose work was arguably satiric, most especially uh, Voltaire. We read Candide, also Dante and, and his Inferno. And I was, uh, as I say, an inverse road to Damascus. Uh, I didn't have uh, a deep religious feelings then, but it, it kind of faded. <laughs> what was the remainder? <laughs> uh, f- faded away in that remarkable year. And I just said, this this way of being in the world makes sense to me. Uh, to To try to cultivate wisdom that's not received, to try to stand a little bit outside of culture or society, and uh, either make fun of it or analyze it in a way, in a way that only a novel can do. A novel's not a bumper sticker, it's not a sermon, it's not uh, a political speech, it's a world unto itself. And I said, sign me up for that. Someday I would love to write satiric novels. Uh, And I finally uh, kept that promise to myself uh, many years later, in 1980, I guess, I produced my first novel, a utopian or dystopian satire called The Wine of Violence. And I never looked back. Do you suppose kids today could have that same kind of spiritual experience with an iPhone? <laughs> uh, you mean just being introduced to the uh, right. the universe of ideas and uh, cantankerous thinking. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Satire, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it took this amazing teacher, Mr. Giordano, standing in flesh and blood before us, and he, he was not propagandizing, <laughs> he was not grinding axes, he was just sharing his astonishing love of literature with our admittedly uh, uh, impressionable 14-year-old minds, 15-year-old minds. Um, I don't think that can be replicated via the internet, iPhones, in, in any way. And he just, as I say, he opened up this universe for me. I thought of novels as merely being escapist. They were about uh, your vicarious participation in the lives of non-existent characters. And I learned, no, an argument, a novel is an argument about life. It addresses the mystery of it all. Uh, Doesn't tell you what to think, but insists that you do think. Um, So I... I adore the internet. Uh, it's it's kept me in print <laughs> through through digital editions uh, and and through Amazon. But uh, I, I think it's vital that uh, that young minds have flesh and blood tutors in their lives. I totally agree with you, and you know it becomes like who is leading whom. You know, is is the tech leading the people or is the people leading the tech? I mean, it gets all very Matrix and Terminator and, you know, we can go on and on with that. But Yeah, I, I, I quite agree. Um, at this point, can, AI is, this. Yeah. is sort of benign, but uh, <laughs> we'll see, you know, yeah. it, uh, as maybe not in our lifetime, but in our kids' or grandkids' lifetime, who knows? It just, it's interesting to think about. But uh, it's scary uh, as well. Yeah, I agree. I don't want to be a technophobe or a Luddite, but it is a brave new world, I think, uh, more so than any, any other medium. I think the Internet is unprecedented. It's a singularity. I've got to bring something up that I see on your bio because it's, the timing is unbelievable. This, this happened totally by accident. There's a novella on here called Shambling Towards Hiroshima. And mm-hmm. I just interviewed a guy before you who wrote a book huh. called Surviving Hiroshima. And it was mm-hmm. a story of his mother, who was a Russian girl who was a mile away from the epicenter, and their whole family survived without a scratch. And mm. it's, a, it's a pretty amazing story. So tell me, what is this novella about? It's um, a uh, satiric, but I but I like to think also a very serious account of uh, the uh, a kind of hidden history of uh, the war in the Pacific and specifically uh, the final year. 
the uh, it turns out that while the army, the U.S. Army, is developing its physics bomb, uh, the Manhattan Project, the Navy was simultaneously, now it can be told, developing a biological weapon with an eye to uh, unleashing it on Japan and forcing uh, the military dictatorship to sue for peace or, or forcing the emperor to uh, request that. It takes the form, my biological weapon, of, a, of gigantic, bipedal, fire-breathing, mutant iguanas. Uh, <laughs> so it really anticipates Godzilla. It, it's it's a, uh, uh, an homage to the Godzilla phenomenon. The, the, the plot turns on uh, an actor, a horror movie actor, who's made a reputation for himself in B-movies of the 40s, portraying mummies and, uh, and the Frankenstein monster and werewolves, etc. Um, and he, uh, never, never vampires, though. He's, uh, he's Jewish, and he thinks there's something anti-Semitic about vampires because they only respond to, to, to Christian arguments about the world. But anyway, he, um, he gets hired to to uh, put on a lizard suit and uh, go shambling through uh, a, uh, a Japanese city, not, not Hiroshima, but a scale model of a, I, I think I used a, a hypothetical or fictional Japanese city, destroying it in front of a delegation that the Japanese has, have sent over to the, to the West Coast, uh, thereby demonstrating the awesome power of this new biological weapon and the hope is that uh, the, the delegation will be so freaked out by this exhibition that, that they will, that that'll be the end of the war in the Pacific. It, uh, I won't tell you how it plays out, but it's essentially the emotional core of the story is my actor, Sims Thorley, and his, uh, his great desire to come through, to be patriotic and to give the performance of a lifetime. Oh, okay. It, totally different than what I thought it was going to be, but uh, <laughs> sounds interesting nevertheless. It, I would say it's a it's a dark comedy, and uh, it 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 got quite a bit of review attention and won an award. Let's talk about your latest one. This was an anthology, you said, and it's the third book is called "And the Last Trump Shall Sound." Uh. And the last Trump shall sound is the title of the anthology. Oh, okay. Which comprises three novellas. The first novella is called "The Breaking of Nations." It's by Harry Turtledove, who has a formidable reputation as someone who can craft alternate histories, which is what the anthology is. My contribution comes second. The title of my novella is The Purloined Republic, and the third is written by Cat Rambo, and uh, uh, it's titled Because It Is My Heart. Um, and uh, the publisher came up with the premise, uh, uh, Shahid Mahmud in Washington, who has a, a small press, uh, Ark Manor. Uh, he's good friends with Harry Turtledove, and together they said, well, okay, Shahid was so concerned about the way the Trump-Pence regime is tearing the country apart at, at the macro level, and also, maybe most tragically, at the micro level. Families are, are you know, violently divided on Trump's policies, and Shahid wanted to address that through thought experiments. Uh, we're not, didn't want us to lecture people. Uh, about which 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 segment of the political spectrum is, is is correct, he just said to we three professionals, run with this, run with this. Uh, so Harry envisioned um, envisions a future in which Republicans keep winning presidential elections. Trump gets a second term, Pence then gets a fir first term, Pence gets a second term. Whereupon this becomes too much for the left-leaning majorities in Oregon, Washington, and California. They unite under, they call themselves the nation of Pacifica under one flag, and they secede from the Union. Uh, and, and that's the big event in Harry's story. Uh, I tell what happens after that 
with with Trump in the White House trying to make life miserable for people in Pacifica. Um, but Pacifica has its own uh, CIA. Um, they uh, they call it the Bug B U G, the Bureau of Undercover Guile. They hire uh, an actress and. Now that I think about it, there's a real connection here to uh, uh, to shambling towards Hiroshima. So it's another James Morrow satire about a performer having to give the performance of a lifetime. They hire a porn star named Polly Nightingale to impersonate uh, a character, a, a fictional character, Walker Lambert, who roughly corresponds to, or more than roughly, who is Franklin Graham, uh, Polly Nightingale, can pass herself off as as uh, Pence's uh, spiritual advisor or his uh, his PFC, his presidential faith counselor, because she happens to look exactly like Walker Lambert, uh, and uh, with the help of, I mean, they're in, they're, it's all. They're all in California to begin with, or Polly is. So with the help of voice coaches and, and makeup geniuses from the movie industry, she brings off this impersonation and convinces Pence to come up with outlandish, uh, borderline absurd uh, dictums and policies. Uh, but he, he doesn't recognize that he's being fooled, but the the people in Pacifica, the Pacifica CIA, are trying to make Pence look ridiculous. And maybe later we can get into these schemes, but they're they're quite outrageous. So what is specifically your book about? The uh, the Purloined Republic. Yeah. Um, is um, well, then. Uh, so I, I gave you much of the setup of my of my novella. OK. Uh, what I just said and then. Cat Rambo takes it in yet a third somewhat radical direction and offers a, a, a dark dystopian vision of life after the second Pence administration. When uh, Shahid uh, Mahmoud came to me uh, and pitched this premise and asked me to join the team, um, and, and by that time, he and Harry had had worked out the parameters of the first of the three novellas. And he said, well, it's going to be, you know, a second term for a first term for Pence, a second term for Pence. Uh, uh, the West Coast secedes. The East, much of the East Coast is pretty unhappy, too, particularly New York and New Jersey, much of New England. And, and I said, I, I don't want to work with that. <laughs> I find that thought infinitely depressing. Uh, I went home and slept on it. And as I woke up the following morning, I remembered one thing that the publisher, Shahid Mahmoud, had said to me, which is that in, in Harry Turtledove's novella, uh, The Breaking of Nations, in the Turtledove story, Trump, it opens with Trump having died. Um, one too many double whoppers, as Harry puts it. And I'm quite certain that the wordplay is intended. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, you know, arterial clogging. Trump has a fatal heart attack. And I said, you know, so Trump is dead. What if uh, my Franklin Graham surrogate, what if Polly Nightingale impersonating the, the faith counselor convinces Pence that she that he can bring Trump back from the dead, that he has that he's, uh, you know, their relationship to uh, to the divine is that intense. They're so close to Jesus. They're so close to God that this supernatural, uh, uh, mir this miracle could occur um, in the Washington National Cathedral. That's the venue that Polly insists to Pence uh, is is where Jesus wants this to happen. Now, uh, I don't I don't mind offering a quasi spoiler. There is no supernatural re resurrection in the in the climax of my novella. It's all done through an audio audio animatronic uh, Trump who comes bursting out of his casket and uh, indulges in a rant that goes on for three solid pages of my of my novella. No paragraph breaks, uh, and he just is Trump on amphetamines uh touching all his 
usual bases. I was able to throw in a bit about the COVID epidemic at the last minute as the book was going to press. Uh, okay, wow. Well, it's a lot of information. <laughs> and, you know, we could probably make comparisons all day long about that to the real world. But uh, yeah. the one thing I try to stay away from on this show is politics uh, on either side. Well, sorry. <laughs> well, only because... It's a, it's a thought experiment. It's yeah, not, no, it's I not. mean, this is this is a fantasy version of, of what could happen. So I'm really, I'm fine with that. It's certainly not a prophecy, a prediction. Yeah. And I'd have to say, I think all three of us found voices that are relatively mellow and non-strident and just like playing with possibilities that's what we get paid to do not for not for having political opinions per se right um i i would uh though <laughs> maybe bracket this effort with uh with orwell's 1984 i mean not to compare our our book to such an iconic text but orwell famously had to defend his book before it's presumed publisher who was reluctant to bring out such a pessimistic vision of the future he defended it by saying but this is not a prediction i'm not in the business of prophecy this this is a warning this is what could happen if certain trends continue and that's fundamental to the the genre of science fiction which is a label that um harry turtledove and cat rambo and myself would happily slap on our on our efforts right well we just we had mentioned previously about the matrix and about terminator and i mean those could be predictions for the future as well because ai is a real possibility well ai is real but the possibility of ai becoming the master um is is very possible in the realm of the human imagination at this point but oh absolutely yeah i mean we we are in the business of extrapolation yeah key, sort of the touchstone in the in the science fiction universe i suppose the real um, question is is will ai develop intellectually enough to come up with its own agenda <laughs> and once it does uh, that then uh, we're in trouble you know but before that it's yeah. it's benign and it's it's we are the master it's the slave to us as soon as it could develop its own agenda and decide to go somewhere else, you know, and then even that was portrayed in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, yes. you know, that, that idea with yeah. Hal and all that. Yeah. Uh, just, well, you could argue it actually goes back to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. True. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, Frankenstein creating, uh, was Creating a being that we lose control of. We lose control of. Um, although I, I don't think Mary Shelley was issuing a warning so much as a thought experiment suggesting that, that Victor Frankenstein might have been within his rights to perform this experiment and pursue his curiosity in that direction. But he was not within his rights to then walk away from the, the results of the experiment, to reject the monster for its, for its ugliness. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I used to be very skeptical about the arguments of Marshall McLuhan, uh, who, who tried to help us understand this sort of maelstrom that we're all swirling around in, this maelstrom of, of high tech. Uh, and, and McLuhan you, uh, explicitly uses the, the metaphor from Edgar Allan Poe, the descent into the maelstrom of, of a mariner who is able to interpret the action of the whirlpool in a way that enables him to to escape. Um, I never cared for McLuhan because it seemed so deterministic and it seemed to trivialize human striving and creativity and imagination. But it, we could pass a, a, a kind of point of no return, a Rubicon, a singularity, whereby the machines, in fact, do become our masters. Um, I, I know some of my colleagues have, have explored that idea already. I might try my own hand at it. Well, I don't ever want to be. And like I said, I'm, I'm happy I was born in 1962 because I doubt I will live long enough to see it unless they, <laughs> they come up with something where we're all living to be 150 years old. 
And then that brings up another question. You know, would you want to live to 150 years old? Because <laughs> yeah, be, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if you were in good health, sure, why not? But you'd have to really replan your life because you might run out of money. And then, yeah, you know, what are you going to do with yourself? <laughs> are, are they going to make, you know, mandatory retirement age at like 120 instead of 65 or 70 where it's kind of pegged now? And I mean, it's it opens up a whole realm of questions. That, yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a great question. Have you written science fiction yourself or no i'm just a, i'm just an avid fan of uh yeah, okay. I, I write screenplays on my my off days good luck yeah i i actually have written reached a point in my own life where i'm saying well wait this is kind of where my uh material resources uh, uh were supposed to run out you know sort of the, the the final years of my life and i'm not sure i planned for it all that well <laughs> So uh, let's get that new stimulus check cracking, okay, Congress? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got one, and uh, they were supposed to send us another one, right? Yeah. But it's yeah, all, I wouldn't, all tied up. I wouldn't mind at all. Yeah. Well, maybe the royalties from and the last Trump shell sound will <laughs> well, there solve you go. my problem. Uh, we do have to wrap this up, James. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, do you have a website you want to give out? People can come check you out, check out the book. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's www.jamesmorrow.net. And I don't yet have the uh, the skinny on and the last Trump shall sound posted there. I, I must see to that immediately. Um, and I'm also on Facebook and I do some Twittering. Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was a fascinating conversation. Um, <laughs> You're very welcome. Best Can we of call you Doug or Douglas? I, can uh, I go by Douglas. I go by Douglas. <laughs> after this, after a whole hour. Uh, you're, you're a great interviewer, Douglas. Maybe we can do this again. Well, thank you very much. Nice to hear that. Been doing it for a while, and uh, it's definitely something I enjoy doing. Best of luck.